Now a portion of tonight's House Rules Committee meeting as members worked on setting the guidelines and amendments for a debate on the bill expected on the floor tomorrow. It's about two hours and 20 minutes. We are here for the consideration of H.R. 2563, the Bipartisan Patient Protection Act of 2001. And uh, we uh, will be hearing from the committees of jurisdiction, which include the Energy and Commerce Committee, the Education and the Workforce Committee, and the Ways and Means Committee. Let me say at the outset that this is an issue that has been uh, before this body many times. And there are many members, uh, including those who are present with us right now, uh, among others who've worked long and hard uh, we know that uh, Speaker Hastert has regularly said that he's spent a decade working on the issue of Patients' Bill of Rights. We know that our colleagues, uh, Messrs. Norwood, Dingle, Gansky, and Fletcher, and uh, many others have, uh, have worked on this. And we uh, obviously are hoping to have a vote on this before we adjourn for the August break and uh, look forward to hearing from our witnesses. And let me uh, begin by recognizing the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Frost. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have procedural questions at this point, not substantive questions. Uh, the first procedural question is, what will be the base bill? We, uh, the, the base bill is going to be the uh, Gansky bill, which uh, has been introduced. The 2563? 2563, that's what it says at the top of the sheet here. H.R. 2563, which is the Gansky bill. Okay. Um, it's my understanding from press reports that Mr. Norwood, Dr. Norwood, now has a variation of this bill. Um, do we know when we will be able to see text on uh, Dr. Norwood's well, let variation? Me, let, me, uh, let me begin by uh, asking unanimous consent to include in the record uh, an outline of the agreement between President Bush, Speaker Hastert, and Congressman Charlie Norwood on the Patients' Bill of Rights, dated, aug dated August 1, 2001. And there are copies of this yes. uh, at the place of every member. And I'd like to uh, ask unanimous consent to have it included in the record. At this juncture, this is the, uh, the language uh, that we do have explaining this. And uh, right at this, they're, they're working on what will, uh, the drafting the final language on this. Uh, as we have begun this hearing process. Um, is it? Um, We're expecting that it'll be an amendment to the uh, uh, base text bill that is being offered by uh, Mr. Gansky. Uh, the question, uh, the specific question, Mr. Chairman, is uh, do we have any idea when we'll see, I understand we have this one page summary. Do we have any idea when we will well, be able I to say, see the actual yes, text? Yes, uh, it's a very good question. I will tell you that they're drafting it as we begin this hearing process. And uh, we anticipate that we'll have the uh, final language as we uh, proceed with uh, the testimony that will come from our colleagues. And we certainly will have it before we uh, mark up this, uh, before we mark up this uh, rule. Before we'll we would vote out a rule. Exactly. Yes, yes we will. Uh, Mr. Chairman, do we have any idea approximately uh, what, how late things will go this evening, approximately what time we'll be able to uh, vote out a rule? No, it's another very good question. And uh, I anticipate that sometime in the next several hours we'll be voting out the rule. Several is an expansive term. Uh, we, of course, we were down here till 1 o'clock, 12.30, 1 o'clock last night. Voting uh, on amendments that the gentleman the, Of course, we didn't start, and, didn't the start, deliberated, and didn't start uh, until 12.30 last night. We is had it, all uh, nine members of the uh, majority is, is it here. contemplated that we will not start until not actually voting until 12.30 tonight, or could we start voting earlier than that, do you think? Oh, I, I you know, it depends on how many votes are uh, called and, uh, and uh, You mean on the floor? Well, on the floor, in this Rules Committee. But I'm asking when we would be able to start voting in the Rules Committee. Well, I think that uh, we'll be able to start voting uh, once we see the final language on this agreement between the President, Speaker Hastert, and Charlie Norwood. And of course, once we finish hearing the testimony of our colleagues who've come before us to make their presentations. So, so we, we don't know at this point. Well, you can infer from my explanation whatever you'd like. I uh, will tell you that we'll do it sometime in the next several hours. 
Well, I appreciate the gentleman's uh, comment. Uh, I hope several is a few rather than many. Um, the uh, And I assume from the gentleman's statement that it is, it is the intention of the uh, Republican leadership to uh, bring this bill to the floor tomorrow. Yes, uh, it's our plan to uh, bring this bill to the floor tomorrow. And, and uh, once we uh, complete passage of the, uh, of the measure and the agreement and all, we will have the entire House of Representatives uh, adjourn until September 9th. Uh, so I, the assumption is that we will not be in session. I'm not coming back to the ninth. Okay, the fifth. So, so, so that we will, will not. September fifth. The assumption is that we will long not, time not, not be in session on Friday of this week. Well, I'd, I'd hope that we could uh, be completed uh, before Friday. I have no other questions. At Thank you point, very much. At this point, let me, as we uh, begin this process, welcome the members of. Uh, we'll begin with the members of the Energy and Commerce Committee, who are here and. Uh, we uh, would like to, uh, the first member that we, that I see who's in the room here is the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Deal. Please uh, come forward and we welcome any prepared statement that you have without objection will appear in the record. And uh, we will uh, certainly look forward to a summary. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have prepared a synopsis that if we you... Just, if, if you just suspend for a moment, Mr. Cox. As a, a, a member of the uh, Commerce, Energy and Commerce Committee, if you'd come forward and join Mr. Deal at the table, we uh, have uh, begun the process here and uh, we welcome you and would like to uh, say that there are other members of the committee who uh, we were anticipating at 8 o'clock and uh, they are not here yet. And so we'd like to begin with, uh, with both of you. Mr. Deal was just beginning his presentation, so why don't we begin with that and then we'll move to yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members. I appreciate the hard work that you do, and I think a lot of us uh, don't fully appreciate that, but, but uh, I can tell you that we do. My, I will be very brief on mine. My, my amendment deals with the issue of subrogation. As many of you recognize that term, it relates to the fact that when you have an injury, and I will give you a typical situation of an automobile collision in which the plaintiff has been injured and has his medical expenses paid by a health insurance carrier and then either through a settlement or through litigation enters into a settlement of his claims against the defendant to then be faced with the fact that the medical insurance company may come back and claim a portion or in some of the worst cases all of that settlement or judgment uh, as reimbursement for their medical expenses. Many states, such as my state of Georgia, have dealt with this by simply passing state legislation. And in our case, we've adopted the old common law rule that subrogation by an insurance carrier would only be permitted once it has been determined that the injured party has been made whole. Uh, and that is a determination that is made by the trial judge in a declaratory judgment action if necessary. I have drafted an amendment that deals with this on two levels. The first is to attempt to make sure that any state action that we may be authorizing under the changes we're making here would be subject to state subrogation statutes, such as in my state, if the state were to have one. And it sets out a model, and quite frankly, the language is virtually identical to our state language. The second portion deals with the same issue at a federal level. And what is happening at the federal level is that since there is no federal statute dealing with the issue, you're seeing federal courts uh, come up with a, a, a quilt, a patched quilt of different type decisions on this issue of subrogation. I quite frankly think that we need to deal with the issue to set a federal position on it. If we don't do it in this legislation, I think we'll ultimately be faced with having to come back and do it again. Since we're dealing with the subject matter, I feel now is an appropriate time. It does adopt the approach that if the plaintiff has been determined to be made whole by virtue of a settlement or a judgment against the party at fault, then the judge could allow the insurance carrier to recoup their medical expenses that they paid on behalf of their insured plaintiff. In the event it's determined that the plaintiff has not been made whole or that to substantially diminish the judgment or settlement uh, would make him less than whole, then the insurance carrier would not be entitled to recoup 
their medical expenses that they have paid. That's a very uh, brief summary of it. Hopefully it uh, adequately explains the position. Thank you very much, Mr. Deal. Let me say that uh, a little while ago, Mr. Tozen indicated to me that uh, he was going to ask Mr. Burr to represent uh, the committee position on this. And so I'd now like to call on uh, Mr. Burr and uh, express appreciation for uh, his hard work on this very important issue. And uh, we will, without objection, take any prepared statement that you have and enter it into the record and welcome a summary. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, um, members of the committee. And my statement will be brief in this ever-changing scenario of what we do and how we do it tomorrow. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm here representing the Chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee as the Vice Chairman. Uh, the Committee uh, with Primary Jurisdiction on H.R. 2563, the Bipartisan Patient Protection Act. Let me be clear, I do not support this bill as written. I believe that it will increase the number of uninsured in the country. Mr. And on... Yes, sir, I'd be happy to. I do not support the bill. Do you mean the amendment is written? The, the bill, H.R. 2563, the base tax. <clears throat> I do not support the bill uh, as written. Uh, I believe it will increase the number of uninsured in this country and unnecessarily increase uh, bureaucracy and litigation. I'm here to support a rule uh, that makes H.R. 2563 in order as long as the rule permits at least three amendments to be offered. Specifically, the rule should allow the Thomas Lipinski Amendment on Association Health Plans and Medical Savings Accounts, number 22, to be made in order. Uh, two, the Thomas Cox Amendment on Medical Malpractice Reforms, number 19, in order. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, there should be a third amendment uh, filed at some point tonight. And I, I let me just say that uh, I said at the outset that we have an agreement that uh, includes President Bush, Speaker Hastert, and Mr. Dor <coughs> Norwood, and we are we have an outline of that which we've entered into the record, and uh, we are anticipating the final language of that, of course, before we do report out this rule. I, I believe the most I could provide to you <clears throat> is probably a similar outline. Right. Um, you, have, you have a copy of the outline which we've just distributed to all the members and have entered into the record. And I think it's safe to say that they're feverishly working on the final language as we sit here. Exactly right. But I would, I would certainly encourage my colleagues on this committee uh, to make what I expect to be the Norwood Amendment uh, in order. Uh, I encourage the committee uh, to allocate the customary assignment of time to the committees of jurisdiction. Uh, I thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very you. much, Mr. Burr. We appreciate your role as vice chairman of the committee representing uh, your colleagues here, and it's a very thoughtful remarks. And happy to represent my fellow California colleague uh, with whom I was pleased to work just a little while ago on an important California amendment, chairman of the Republican Policy Committee, and the author of an amendment which uh, Mr. Burr has just referred. So let me say that also without objection, any prepared statement that you have will, without, will appear in the record in its entirety, and we welcome a summary. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Frost. Uh, and members, uh, uh, I will not speak on the uh, uh, Thomas Cox Amendment because Chairman Thomas is going to present that. Uh, but I do have uh, three amendments that I would like to draw to your attention. Uh, the first uh, is to add a patient choice provision to the bill. Uh, we've had a rather significant national debate about the right of patients to sue, the venue for those lawsuits, uh, what kinds of uh, uh, limits might be put on those rights uh, if they are granted and so on. What I am proposing is that we leave the answers to all of these questions up to the patients and to the consumers and let them have a choice. So what I am offering in this amendment is to make different uh, approaches optional. Uh, you should have the option to choose a plan that has exactly the same health care benefits but has an election, for example, for uh, binding arbitration instead of a lawsuit if you want to elect that. Uh, you should have an opportunity to have uh, some other form of alternative dispute resolution. The key, though, is that 
the insured, not the employer, gets to make this choice. As you know right now, most of these contracts are either contracts of adhesion or, or at least they're like rental car contracts where you've got to buy the package and you don't really have any authority uh, as a consumer or as a patient or as an individual. Uh, this would give that choice and give that option uh, to the individuals. It is completely voluntary. There's no question that the bill that we're going to put on the floor increases costs of health insurance. Those increases have been described as only modest uh, by proponents of the legislation, as uh, somewhat less than modest by opponents, but we have some question about how much will the cost of health insurance increase. We don't want to cause people to fall off the rolls of the insured or not to get insurance in the first place, uh, and so we should in this legislation take the opportunity to do something uh, to make insurance more affordable uh, and more widespread. And so patient choice uh, is a way to do that. The second amendment that I would bring to your attention uh, is a very simple one. Uh, it would direct punitive damages, which will be unlimited, uh, to uh, the Medicare Trust Fund. As you know, uh, uh, Justice Potter Stewart of the U.S. Supreme Court uh, wrote uh, extensively on the role of punitive damages in our American legal system. We've had some discussion in connection with this bill about banning punitive damages because they are unrelated to the injury suffered, uh, because uh, uh, they provide uh, sometimes uh, windfalls to lawyers, uh, and they are uh, a cost that all patients and all hospitals and all doctors and the whole system uh, has to bear. Uh, what I would propose, and this has been proposed by others many times uh, in different ways, is that we make a prescription drug benefit under Medicare uh, easier to finance by saying, yes, you can collect these damages. Yes, punitive damages will be assessed against malefactors. Yes, they will be uh, unlimited. Uh, but uh, there won't be an opportunity to game the system by having them uh, paid over to lawyers because these are civil monetary penalties. They are not damage. They're not even non-economic damages. They're not damages of any kind. Uh, and instead, they will be paid over to the Medicare Trust Fund to offset the cost of providing a Medicare prescription drug benefit and other Medicare benefits. The third and final uh, proposal that I would make uh, is also a very simple one. And it is designed to make sure that lawsuits are fair, that uh, bad people pay, uh, that winners win, uh, and that justice is done. In any health care lawsuit, each party should be liable for the damage that he, she, or it caused. You can't leave that liability in somebody else's lap. It's a fair share rule. If a jury determines that someone caused 30% of the damage, then that person should pay 30% of the damages. That is not presently our system. We have a system of joint and several liability, and it is uh, uh, another perverse incentive to name everybody in a lawsuit, no matter what their degree of responsibility, uh, and to extort, uh, in many cases, unfair settlements, or in any case, to protract lit litigation and put those costs of course, on the taxpayers who have to pay to support the court system, but also uh, on the health care system uh, from which all of these monies are extracted. We want to promote good lawsuits. We want to promote justice. And so it's very important that we have this fair share rule. And if a party is responsible, that party must pay. Uh, those are the three amendments I would offer, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. It's very clear. We appreciate that. Uh, Congratulations to all of you as members of the committee for having spent as much time on this as you have. And we're looking forward to final resolution, at least on the House product, tomorrow. Mr. Goss? No questions. Thank you. Mr. Frost? Well, it's um, interesting. The uh, question is where to start, because uh, I would ask the uh, Mr. Cox, if he has seen the one-page summary uh, that has been provided to the committee, between the President, Speaker Hastert, and uh, Congressman Norwood. Um, I have uh, something that is uh, one page and three lines, so it's I at think, least I a think, uh, actually a copy is right there. Yeah. 
because I really wasn't clear about what you said and I, at one point. I'd like to go back to it. Uh, according to this one-page summary down at the next to last paragraph, um, it is under damage limits. This is the next to last heading. Mm -hmm. uh, it says punitive damages will be capped at 1.5 million. Um, if I, I thought I heard you to say in describing one of your amendments that there were not limits on punitive damages. Uh, there are no limits on punitive damages in the amendment that I'm offering. So that is not my amendment. Uh, if separately in the base bill, a substitute or an amendment, uh, the Congress decides to do this, then my amendment will work just fine with that as well. But I am not proposing that in this amendment. Are you asking the committee to make your amendment in order to the Norwood amendment? Uh, are you asking the committee make in your amendment in order to the base bill? It's, it's unclear to me how we would proceed if your, committee, if your amendment were be made, to be made in order. Well, uh, because we are just now getting the details of this agreement between President Bush, the Speaker, and Congressman Norwood, uh, I leave it to this committee uh, to determine the order of proceedings on the floor. Uh, I offer the amendment uh, for your consideration and hope it will be made in order. And of course, we may have the same dilemma uh, with other amendments that will be offered. Because if I heard the, the chairman correctly, uh, he was saying that Norwood is not offering a substitute, but rather an amendment. Right. And the, the base text continues to be uh, H.R. 2563, the Gansky bill. So to the extent that amendments that are offered by witnesses before this committee are inconsistent with the Norwood amendment, uh, we would have to sort that out at some point in terms of the uh, priorities, in terms of which ones would be considered first and what would happen under those circumstances. Well, obviously, we, uh, you know, that would be taken into consideration as we proceed with marking the... I, I will say, Mr. Frost, that uh, having worked on this for a, a few years, the amendment was drafted essentially to what is now known as Norwood. Uh, it... Uh, also works perfectly well with Fletcher. Uh, the Fletcher bill was developed in substantial part uh, uh, in conjunction with proceedings uh, of the uh, policy committee, subcommittee on health care that Mr. Fletcher chairs. And I'm, of course, chairman of that full committee and was involved in that process. So I I'm quite certain that if you were to choose to apply this uh, as an amendment to either, that it would be completely compatible. It's a, it's a policy election. And you can you can accept it or reject it on that basis, but I don't think it's incompatible with either. Well, I'm curious, uh, Mr. Cox, is there any particular reason why you did not place a limit on punitive damages? Did you think that was not appropriate? Uh, why did your amendment not contain a limit on punitive damages? Uh, that's really the main stage or one of the main focal points of the debate. Uh, that we've been having throughout the country, and I was quite confident that that would be addressed by this committee and by uh, the uh, base text and amendments to it. Uh, well, I was just curious as to why you did not place a limit on punitive damages in your particular amendment. Uh, because it is compatible with uh, a system in which punitives are available at any level. Uh, and so if they are unlimited or if they are fixed in amount or up to an amount, uh, the redirection to Medicare works in either case, and, and the improvement in the incentives of parties on all sides uh, is gained. Anyway. So you are not you're not expressing an opinion as to whether punitive damages should be limited or should not be limited. Uh, not in this amendment. As a, if you're asking me how I would vote on such amendment on the floor, I would, if it were, uh, in all other respects, a reasonable approach, I would vote for it. For a limit. Yes. I think that uh, if we're trying to reduce costs in the health care system, that that's another reasonable way to do it. There are always trade-offs, but if you're compensating 100% of all economic damages, 100% of medical costs, 100% of future lost earnings, uh, pain and suffering and everything else, uh, then uh, there isn't any question but that uh, patients, consumers, individuals, families are being made whole. Uh, and that would wash out some of the additional burden on the hospitals, on the doctors, on the system, on the, in, the insurance costs, and so on. Yeah, and I have but, another but question. But again, I just yeah. I, I want to be clear to the other members 
that, that is not the amendment I'm offering. That's something that the President apparently has uh, agreed to, and I would support that. Um, I have another question, and uh, it, I don't know which of you could respond to this. And, of course, it may be that, that none of you can respond, because this really deals with the new Norwood Amendment. Uh, and I don't know if you have had a chance to uh, talk to Congressman Norwood or if you, any of you have had a chance to, re, uh, to review what he has in mind other than just this one-page summary. But I do have a, a, a specific question. I'll ask the question, and maybe none of, the, no, none of you can answer it. Uh, the uh, description that has been handed to us uh, under cause of action, liability provisions, um, says that patients will be guaranteed new federal remedies to hold their health care plans accountable when they have been injured by a wrongful denial or delay of medical care. It's very specific. It's talking about a wrongful denial or delay. What happens if it's just malpractice? It's not a denial. It's not a delay. Um, a doctor simply makes a mistake and the, and the patient is injured. Well, it's my understanding that doctors are already liable for malpractice and that ERISA preempts suits against the insurer. I understand. And what happens if a doctor who works for an HMO commits malpractice under this legislation, will the HMO be responsible? Well, I, I hesitate to answer the question on the basis of this one-page handout. And, and, of course, this agreement was just reached today. I'm not privy to the that's, that's a question that we will uh, get to when we hear from the other witnesses on this. I was just curious if any of these were familiar enough with what uh, Mr. Norwood is proposing to be able to respond to that, and I, I gather that they are not familiar enough to be able to respond to that point. I might just add, I think that is one of the issues that Mr. Culberson will address it perhaps when he gets to the issue of preemption of state law. That's one of the areas that states that have already addressed the issue by state statute have taken within the province of their authority under state law uh, now to include that in state actions without the necessity of us acting in that area. And that's one of those areas that's been a gray area. What do you do with states that don't have state statutes? Of course, we have a state statute in Texas, as so you do know. We in Georgia. But the majority of states do not have a statute True. at this point. Okay. I have another question. Thank you very much, Mr. Frost. Mr. Linder. Mr. Burr, you, you said that I do not support the bill. Which bill do you not support? Do not support the base bill as written. Um, is that the HR Norwood bill or the Fletcher bill? Is that the Norwood bill or the, the, the bill referred to as the Dingle Gansky bill? Yeah, okay. <clears throat> okay. And, and, uh, you reserve the right to support the changes that I, I believe that the changes that I outlined and from the spirit of what I've heard of the president's uh, uh, and, and, and Charlie Norwood's agreement, uh, it would address many of the problems that I believe uh, myself and colleagues share on the concern that um, without that amendment, without this agreement, uh, that we would uninsure many people. Uh, and that we would bring a new cost to the health care system. We can alleviate that with what we think the agreement looks like between the President and Mr. Norwood. But you're not addressing any of these amendments that have been put before us? Uh, it, from a committee standpoint, I'm not here to speak on the amendments of my colleagues on the committee, but on three specific uh, amendments that we feel are vital to the bill to change it to a point uh, where we think it would be good legislation. Mr. Cox, is there a precedent for redirecting awards? Yes. Uh, we have not chosen to do it yet in the federal system. But is there a precedent where, where punitive damages can be redirected to Yes. Somebody? States have, have uh, undertaken this. States have undertaken. So this is not new territory. Right. I might add, Mr. Linder, our state has that. 75 percent, as you know, goes to the state. Um, Mr. Deal, I want you to expand just a little bit on your, your amendment. Okay. And is it doing anything to subsume or superimpose or an agreement over the McCarran-Ferguson Act that gives the states the authority to handle insurance issues? I don't perceive that it does. Um, as I indicated, states like ours already have passed state statutes to deal with the issue. The real problem has been, first of all, for those states that even have state statutes, they have taken different opinions as to whether they are preempted in an ERISA action as to that issue. And secondly, in a purely federal action that we're contemplating here, 
obviously state, state statutes would not apply. Um, there have been some real horror stories. Uh, one that was reported in the, uh, the June <laughs> issue of the American Bar Association Journal uh, of a New Jersey case in which uh, plaintiff uh, received a $600,000 judgment and every dime of the judgment was turned around and paid, ordered by a declaratory judgment of a federal judge to be paid back to the plaintiff's health insurance company. And the young boy who was nine years old uh, received none of the money. And the problem, of course, sometimes is that the defendant in an action has limited insurance coverage. And even if you get all of that in a settlement or a judgment, it may not really be even the equivalent of what you have incurred in your own health care expenses. So if you allow the medical insurer to recoup everything they paid, and many times it, it uh, consumes the entire amount. Thank you. Mr. Slaughter. Mr. Chairman, I have a, just a couple procedural questions, if I may. Um, does the President support of the Gansky Norwood bill as amended supersede his former support of the Fletcher bill? And I know that Fletcher is asking for an amendment and a substitute. Is that negated by his support of Gansky Norwood? Well, let me just say that. Um, the outset again, the, uh, as far as what it is that the president supports, the base text is again HR 2563, which is the uh, the Gansky bill. And was not the bill he supported yesterday. Excuse me. And was not the bill he supported previously. Oh, he was not Fletcher. supporting that. He was not okay. supporting that. He was supporting the. Uh, the I'm just wondering where we are with the Fletcher. And uh, as of right now, we have before us a statement of the agreement uh, that includes President Bush, Speaker Hastert. Mr. Norwood, mm -hmm. and uh, this addresses the liability issue. Right. There are other issues that Mr. Fletcher dealt with, and uh, one of those I know is uh, a proposed amendment. Uh, Mr. Burr referred to that amendment earlier, and that is the amendment on access, which uh, is a, a priority of, of uh, concern. And I am aware of the fact that the, uh, the President is strongly supportive of the issue of uh, access here. And Mr. So Chairman, I if I could say, just Mr. to Burr. help clear it up, it is sure. my understanding uh, that Mr. Fletcher will not seek to offer his bill as a substitute, okay, which would eliminate it in the Mexican <coughs> right. with uh, her understanding. I see. That's, that's, that's what I was, I was really uh, curious about. And also, the uh, Gansky uh, Norwood number nine, which uh, of the offsets. Pay for the bill. I assume everybody agrees that that's an important. Well, we uh, we have uh, really not made a determination yet as to exactly what amendments we'll be making in order. We want to hear from our colleagues as we proceed with that. Okay. So as a, we all understand that the only difference in this base bill with the president's agreement is in the liability section. That's that is the that is the aspect the agreement of that the we agreement. have deals with the liability issue. And if this is here, if that is approved, the president will approve. Oh, I, I don't. I don't want to. But we say, need to know that. We need to know exactly what. I mean, is that what this was all about? I mean, I'm not really. Yeah, I, I mean, we're we're we're, we're we're in the midst of this uh, hearing process, and I think that we want to hear from witnesses, right. and we're going to do our uh, work on this, and then your we'll point see is well taken. Out, it was Burr. just it was simply procedural right. issues. Chairman, I was if I could add, not uh, questioning witnesses. I beg your pardon, gentlemen. The, there, there has been an intense negotiation that has gone on for over a week uh, between the president personally and Charlie Norwood because of the president's belief that he needed, wanted a bill that he could sign so that patient protections could be part of law. I think the president acknowledged today with this agreement on the liability uh, portion of it that with passage of that Norwood amendment, uh, he, he would then have a bill that he would feel comfortable signing as president and we could go straight into the protections for patients. Thank you for that. Mr. diaz Blart. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, want to thank uh, our distinguished panel for their uh, important contributions to uh, this debate, which uh, obviously uh, in the health care area in terms of protections is one of the most important we've had, and if not the most important. In, um, many, many years. Uh, I have uh, no questions at this time, Mr. Chairman.
much. Mr. Hastings. Mr. I know it comes as no surprise that I cite again to my experiences. I did so under human cloning, and I'm sure um, that the chair remembers me talking about my college years. This isn't about my college years. This is about 40 years of being a lawyer. And you want to talk about any of your grades in law school? Uh, made, you talked about made the, excellent grades in law school, yes, Mr. Chairman. Yes, we suspected that. Yeah. Uh, We've gone through his uh, the one class years, he didn't do 13 well. years as a judge, and nobody had to grade me <laughs> uh, as it was. Um, I, I'm curious about several things here. Um, uh, first off, I, 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 I want to make it very clear, um, as a lawyer, 40 years, I find um, all of this um, uh, to be the most vociferous attack upon a profession that I have seen in my career or that I have read about with reference to lawyers. And many of the persons that are participants in the development of this measure are lawyers as well, and I respect that. We obviously have differences. Mr. Chairman, as it pertains to the Rules Committee, the majority set a deadline yesterday for amendments of 5 p.m. Where I come from, deadlines mean deadlines. I also understand the Rules Committee has extraordinary uh, discretion, and I respect that. And in the summary of the amendments, some of the amendments are filed late. And likely this evening or late um, um, uh, today or in the morning, early in the morning, or whenever it is uh, that we vote out a rule, we will have an opportunity to vote on them, and we will have had an opportunity to hear from the witnesses, um, and we will obviously have an opportunity to question those witnesses. Absolutely. What I'm being asked to do here that flies in to my face as not being reasonable is to ask witnesses questions about something I have not seen. I've seen 2563, and it's been in the realm and widely advertised. But the base bill is being prepared beyond, I mean, the amendment to the base bill is being prepared beyond the deadline. If I wanted to ask either of these gentlemen, particularly Mr. Dingle, Mr. Gansky, or Mr. Norwood, who I um, imagine would be here, and since the speaker was a part of the deal, I guess I should want to ask uh, the speaker as a member of this body how it is he arrived at his conclusions and um, uh, with reference to caps and liabilities and other matters. I won't get that opportunity. So whenever we come back to vote out the rule, what I'll see then, obviously, must be the amendment. It's past the deadline, and I'm asking you, how is that reasonable? How do you, as chair of this committee, expect me to be able to frame intelligent questions to something as important as this when I haven't seen it? Well, it's a very uh, good and fair question. Let me say, as uh, the full membership of this committee is fully aware, we, uh, as we move ahead uh, with legislation. We always give the minority an ample time to look at the uh, provisions that uh, we are prepared to consider. And we go through uh, a very long hearing process uh, on an issue like this. And uh, I will say that there are going to be uh, issues that will come forward and be addressed by uh, the authors of different amendments and uh, the various proposals that we have. You're absolutely correct. And we are happy that you're very happy that you're a member of this committee. And as you've underscored several times, you're the newest member of the committee. Uh, the full membership is aware of the fact that, that the Rules Committee does have the discretion as we prepare to move the agenda to meet uh, the constraints that exist uh, out there to fashion a measure uh, in as fair a way as we possibly can. Sure. And, and I, I, I will just say uh, to the gentleman that I believe that we're going to do everything possible to ensure that he has the opportunity to raise questions uh, of concern to when, as many of our colleagues as we can. When then, Mr. Chairman, will I get an opportunity to see the Norwood Amendment? As soon as we, we'll, we'll be seeing it at the same time. Uh, and then and, we'll have ample time. And then you're going to have ample time to All right, look let me at move to Mr. We'll Cox, if I may, Mr. Chairman, and um, ask um, um, Mr. Cox with reference uh, to the measure uh, that he offers on punitive damages. <coughs> what do you perceive, Mr. Cox, as, as a lawyer? or having been involved in mine and your profession for a substantial period of time, what, what would be the incentive for lawyers to vigorously pursue 
punitive damages if in fact um, uh, uh, the funding is, uh, uh, if, if achieved, <coughs> is going to go someplace else and they don't get an opportunity to share it. And in short, the contingent fee process was set up to incentivize lawyers. And people always talk about big awards. They don't ever talk about little awards and they don't ever talk about no awards. The lawyers invest in their firms millions of dollars in and get nothing. So what, what, what would motivate a lawyer to get to say, I'm going to try to get punitive damages where they are rightly due? And I might add, I would also want to point out to you how some of these other measures leave a lot to be desired with reference to precedent in mine and your profession. Right. You, you put a good question, and it has a very straightforward answer. Uh, after the passage of this amendment, were to become law, the incentives for lawyers to add punitive damages claims to their cases would be every bit as powerful as they are today. Uh, you know as a lawyer, uh, particularly in the federal system where you served as a judge, that today 93 percent of cases in the federal system settle without a single day of trial. Absolutely. What that means is that the paradigm that we all have of a kindly Judge Wapner, if not a kindly Judge Judy, uh, applying the law to the facts in each case uh, where everyone is entitled to his or her day in court uh, isn't really what happens. Rather, lawsuits settle. In fact, the system is sufficiently busy that many judges, if not most, believe that they are succeeding if they force cases to settlement. When you make a demand for punitive damages, uh, if the case is settled and there are no punitive damages ordered by a judge or jury, uh, then that becomes part of the settlement that you extract in the case. Uh, and lawyers will have a very big incentive still uh, to name deep pocket defendants for that reason. What we're trying to do is very modestly adjust uh, the incentives in favor of uh, justice in the cases so that perhaps uh, uh, we will find uh, a little bit less perverse incentive to go only after deep pocket defendants. I appreciate the gentleman's very straightforward answer. I know that you said at the outset that um, you would await Mr. Thomas to be able to explain the other measure that is an amendment that you are a co-sponsor of. Um, that's Thomas Cox, Sensenbrenner, Tolson, Boehner. Chris, do you really believe that it is proper and fit for us as a body to grandfather existing laws and allow future state law, future state law in 50 states to supersede federal standards? I mean, do you really believe that? Uh, actually, I think that that's uh, an enormous concession to the arguments of those who say there shouldn't be any standards uh, set by the federal government at all. As you know, uh, much of the argument here is that uh, we oughtn't to put these things in federal court, that we ought to let the states do it one at a time, that they ought to have their own standards. And so uh, what we are attempting to do in this amendment, the one that you refer to, but not one that I've spoken on here yet so that nobody's confused, uh, is to say that if a state acts, that they will set the rules in this area. It is only for states that haven't any standards at all that the federal government will fill in the void. Uh, so, uh, to reach for an analogy, uh, it's a little bit like uh, federal common law and federal enclaves. You've got to provide some law where there isn't any. And what we're trying to do is uh, uh, perhaps then replicate the success that we've had in California, uh, where Governor Brown and uh, an all Democratic legislature responded with what we call MICRA uh, in the teeth of what was a physician's strike at the time. And, and uh, we have had lower health care insurance costs in our state and as a result more money to pay for benefits uh, to patients uh, as a result of that. Well, Jerry Brown did something good then evidently, but it's, that's sort of an exception to the rule that I'm thinking about because I have a great deal of experience with states not doing things um, uh, for a considerable number of years, not only in this arena, but in almost all arenas having to do with our society. But that said, I guess I'll reserve until such time as I can raise hell on the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Hastings. Mr. Hastings. 
Mr. Sessions. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I missed the attack that evidently occurred by this panel on lawyers. I failed to see that. I think that uh, I saw three uh, members of the, uh, I assume, Commerce Committee come here to present their arguments on behalf of a public policy that is important, and that is that we protect patients, that we move forward on some important things that have been kicked around this Congress for many years, and that we preserve, or as we move forward to try and preserve, an opportunity for public policy to deal with getting more people to be insured and for us to solve health care differences that we have at the doctor's office or the hospital instead of going to the court. And what I've heard tonight is an immediate attack uh, on the provisions that you're trying to do to protect people from having to go to court to making the things work. And that is what I am intensely interested in, and I fail to see the attack at all. And I find that the things that you have done to be not only uh, serving in the best interests of doctors and patients, but also as wise and prudent public policy to make sure that we do not shift this to where everything goes to court and we ruin the system that we built. And so I'm proud of what you've done and look forward to also vigorously uh, working with you on the floor for the success uh, of this package. I yield back, Chairman. Uh, any response or? Okay. Gentlemen, thank you very much for, uh, for being here. Let me say that uh, we uh, are looking forward to uh, casting four votes downstairs now as this vote has just begun. And what I would like to do is uh, Mr. Norwood is going to be joining us, Mr. Gansky and Mr. Dingle, and members, those are uh, members of the committee. And uh, I would like to um, have them, and Mr. Barry can join him as well. What I'd like to do is, uh, is recess uh, at this point and uh, reconvene uh, as we begin the last of the four votes that we're casting downstairs, and then we will uh, proceed with that panel consisting of Messrs. Norwood, Gansky, Dingle, and Barry. And with that, the committee. Yes. Yes, we've done that. We've done that. Thank you very much for that recommendation, Mr. Dingle. We look forward to stands in recess. He's been put away somewhere. <laughs> Bill, we're teeing up a uh, barroom brawl for you. Guests are always welcome, but...